Good evening and welcome this welcome to Modernists That Matter. I'm Francis Levy. Ed Sessian and I are co-directors of the Philip Tatey Center. And before we begin this uh, evening's program, I just wanted to call your attention to a few events and, and also to the art show on aggression, which is attendant upon our series on aggression, of which we have two more parts. This coming Saturday will be the, the politics and psychobiology of aggression and its violence in the city. And then on the 26th of April, which is a Sunday, right, Ed? We have yes. the, the politics and psychobiology of aggression, and that one is on evil. So those are two. And this particular exhibit, if you see, you, you, these, are, these are photographs by Alexander Gibbons of the Rwanda survivors uh, and their testimony. And then it, we've, the, 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 the exhibition is a counterbalance between highly realistic images that are anchored in reality. And then we have Margaret Rolicke's painting of stick-ons, and you should look very carefully at it. Uh, and then a number of other works, uh, Joyce Kozlov's uh, what are, what are they really? Co Collages, collages that, that sort of Collages. deal with the subjects of aggression in both abstract and in literal ways. Uh, next week is kind of jazz week at Philip Tatey's. On the, on the 21st, we have Living in the Musical Moment, and uh, the, the whole subject is the, uh, basically, it's, the subject is Andy Stein who is a backup player in the Garrison Keillor band for Berry Home Companion. And he is going to be here with uh, Lewis Porter and talking about, I think he's going to be talking about the fiddling and about all the very, he's a polymath, he's a polymath of musical performance, actually. And it, he's a wonderful musician, and we're very excited about that show. And then later in the week, on the 25th, we have a jazz great Odeon Pope here. And it's a discussion and performance session called Lightning in a Bottle, Presenting and Preserving Jazz. Now, Surrealism and Beyond, the second in this program on French poetry, will be dealing with Paul Eluard and Rene Char, and that's on May 13th. Uh, please take note that there are books for sale by, by, by our panelists tonight, and afterwards you can go into the adjacent annex and, and purchase those books. I am now pleased to introduce Lois Oppenheim. Lois Oppenheim is Distinguished Scholar, Professor of French, and Chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at Montclair State University, where she also teaches courses in psychoanalysis and the literary and visual arts. She has authored or edited 10 books and published over 70 articles. Her most recent books include A Curious Intimacy, Art and Neuropsychoanalysis, and The Painted Word, Samuel Beckett's Dialogue with Art. Dr. Oppenheim is a member of the advisory board of the Philatelli Center, as well as scholar associate member of the New York Psychoanalytic Institute, an honorary member of the William Allison White Institute. Lois Oppenheim will moderate tonight's discussion and introduce our other distinguished guests. Take it away, Lois. Thank you. Uh, I'd like Lois to... and I also know each other oh. from other places. <laughs> Which will be unspecified. <laughs> no, we went to camp we together. Went to summer camp together. <laughs> That's very important. We didn't discover yeah, until Philip Tate's together. <laughs> okay. Um, Welcome all. I'm delighted you could all be here. Um, let me begin by introducing my fellow panelists. Marianne Cause, directly to my right, is Distinguished Professor of English, French, and Comparative Literature at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She's been the recipient of Guggenheim, National Endowment for the Humanities, Getty, and Rockefeller Fellowships is a past president of the Modern Language Association, the American Comparative Literature Association, the Association for the Study of Dada and Surrealism, and she served on many editorial boards and national committees. She's the author of numerous volumes on art and literature, including The Surrealist Look in Erotics of Encounter, Picasso's Weeping Woman, The Life and Art of Dora Maar, Robert Motherwell with Pen and Brush, and books on Virginia Woolf, Marcel Proust, Salvador Dali, and Henry James. She has also written a memoir called To the Boathouse, and uh, Marianne has been the editor and translator of far too many volumes of surrealist poetry to even begin to, to mention them here. Nancy Klein, to her right, has published numerous short stories, essays, memoirs, and translations. She's been awarded a National Endowment for the Arts Creative Writing Grant and first prize in the Minnesota Review Fiction Contest. Her books include a novel entitled The Faithful, a critical study of the poet René Char, 
It's, uh, that book was called Lightning, a biography of Elizabeth Blackwell, MD, called A Doctor's Triumph, and a series of new translations which include Paul Eloir's Capital of Pain, which she did with Marianne Cause and Patricia Terry, Jules Laforgue's Perseus in Laforgue's Selected Poetry and Prose with Patricia Terry, and René Charge's uh, Fuhrer and Mystery and Other Texts, also done with Marianne Cause. Her reviews appear regularly in the New York Times Sunday Book Review and American Book Review. And Nancy Klein has taught at Barnard, Harvard, UCLA, the University of Massachusetts, Wellesley, and she's now an associate at the Bard Institute for Writing and Thinking. So we're delighted to have both of these distinguished people with us tonight. And before we begin, I'd just like to say, <laughs> that's a lot. It's a, a huge amount to used to introduce people. OK. It's not much you can do when the CVs are pages and pages and pages. Um, let me begin tonight by uh, drawing attention to the title of this event, Modernists That Matter. Before we can say too much about why they matter and who among them matters, I'd just like to say a word or two about modernists. I think we all kind of know what we mean when we call someone a modernist. At least we know that it's a, this person is a practitioner of something called modernism, which is a word that has both aesthetic and historical implications. And we tend to think of modernists as somehow oppositional, rebellious, revolutionary in any number of imaginative ways. Um, with regard to the modernist poets, many of them have rid their work of um, any substantial narrative unity. They uh, tend to employ a kind of displaced syntax. Um, they have, many of them have altered their typography, etc. And we tend to think of modernist efforts as encompassing a more or less totalizing vision, which I think we see when we consider how many isms are associated with modernism, such as cubism, dadaism, surrealism, abstract expressionism, conceptualism, et cetera, et cetera. But there are also those who believe that every century or at some period approximating a century has its own modernist period, and that we therefore have to distinguish between multiple modernisms. At the same time, there are those who believe that there has never been anything called modernism. And I'm thinking, for example, of the sociologist by the name of Bruno Latour, who claimed that the idea of a time that passes irreversibly and annuls the entire past in its wake is an idea that's completely distortive erroneous, and he went so far as to say, and I quote, no one has ever been modern, modernity has never begun. <laughs> that way of thinking, of course, rids us of the notion of the postmodern as well, <laughs> which is what <laughs> philosopher Richard Rorty has proposed, actually. And I quote, it's one of these terms that has been used so much that nobody has the foggiest idea what it means. It means one thing in philosophy, another thing in architecture, and nothing in literature. It would be, <laughs> it would be nice to get rid of it. It isn't exactly an idea. It's a word that pretends to stand for an idea. Or maybe the idea that one ought to get rid of is that there is any need to get beyond modernity, which in good postmodern fashion brings us right back to modernism. So what can we say to begin a panel on French poetry as modernist. Um, I think we have to say that French poetry first became modern uh, when it began to protest the sentimentality of early 19th century uh, French romanticism and also the positivistic philosophy that was very much in the air in mid 19th century France. Uh, Mallarmé, Rimbaud, Valéry uh, all had a kind of thinking about poetry um, that had already been articulated by Baudelaire, which Marianne and Nancy may wish to say something about, um, and that that thinking was particularly modern in the way in which it did not represent or represent the real, but rather was evocative of it, was suggestive of it. And Baudelaire, in fact, has been considered by many the last great romantic poet and the first great modernist poet. And what was particularly modern about him was not only his sensibility and the new sensibility that he gave to poetry, but the awareness within his poetry of the um, 
role of the poet as creator and what it meant to create. And what I'm really referring to is his idealization of the poet as someone who could not only um, transform nature, but surpass, transcend nature. Which um, brings us now to the subject of our event tonight, um, why these two modernists that we have selected matter, Apollinaire and, uh, well, starting with um, Mallarmé and then Apollinaire, why they matter and uh, why we've actually chosen um, these two poets to talk about this evening. I'd like to begin by addressing um, that question to Marianne um, and then to Nancy, if she'd like to add to that. Um, and just a word about the format. We'll spend um, the first part of the evening talking about Mallarmé and the poems that you have uh, presumably downloaded. Um, and Marianne and Nancy are going to read um, from these texts, both in French and in English. And the reason that we're going to do that is I, I, I truly believe that poetry is written not um, only to be read, but to be heard. And for those of you who do not understand the French, I don't think it makes all that much difference. You're going to hear it in, in the poems. You're going to hear the text in English. And to hear the sound and the rhythm of the French, I really think, is essential. Um, so I, I have asked um, them to read in French as well. So um, I will now shut up and um, begin by asking Marianne if she could tell us something about why these two poets are modernists who matter and why you actually chose these two, well, at least one of them. Yeah, well, Mallarmé, I believe, is the most important poet, like right now, for the 21st century. So for me, he not only mattered when he mattered, but he matters more and more. And as you will have seen in the, in the blurb for this, he was an incredibly inventive sort of person. And he uh, invented a whole new typography for the famous poem called Un coup de deux n'abolira jamais le hasard. Uh, a throw of the dice will never abolish chance. And one wonderful thing about Mallarmé in parentheses is he is just like modernism. There are so many translations of him, and every single one is so different. My view of modernism tonight is that it is a sort of uh, a catch-all phrase for the, the kinds of poems that look at themselves instead of looking at the outside world. Therefore, uh, Mallarmé, who is the great symbolist, uh, is the person we chose to begin with. And in fact, uh, I was interested that Lois put them backwards first, that Apollinaire and Mallarmé, because Apollinaire seems to me wonderful and joyous as he is, a lot less contemporary, at least for me, whoops, sorry about that, uh, than uh, is Mallarmé. Mallarmé seems to me suddenly to be going on, and he's more and more important. Um, I have with me a poster, let me start with the poster, which is just about Mallarmé, because we were drinking absinthe the other night, and wonderfully, <laughs> it was called absinthe, and Mallarmé is best known, maybe, for saying you define a flower as that which is, la fleur est absente de tous les bouquets, the flower is absent from all uh, bouquet. In other words, there isn't any flower. Flower, the point of the flower is that it isn't there. And that's what symbolism works into. And it seems to me that, I mean, precisely as you will hear, since we will indeed read, and I think maybe we should read the English first and then the French, uh, so that you'll, mm -hmm. you know, put them together. Uh, it seems to me that the, that the excitement about Mallarmé still going on now will come up even in our discussion of Apollinaire, because Mallarmé wrote a great many things under other names. And he wrote a whole thing called the, the Latest Fashion under many different pseudonyms. Um, he wrote about jewelry. He wrote about uh, the salon. He wrote about uh, New Year's Eve banquet under lots of names, Madame de Ponty, Mademoiselle de, and so <laughs> forth and so forth. Um, and as different uh, Marguerite de Ponty. And all of these people whom he invented have different styles. And nobody knew it was Mallarmé. It was a whole journal that he published all by himself, which I love. That sort of multiplicity of modernisms and of Mallarmé seems to me to be one of the reasons we picked him. And as for Apollinaire, he's the most beloved, probably, of all French poets, certainly of the 20th century. And there's a wonderful saying about him, which is true. Everybody, all the people who write 
write on Apollinaire or like each other. That has never happened in the history of <laughs> French literature. <laughs> it certainly doesn't happen with anyone else I happen to work on. But Apollinaire, absolutely. There's something about him and his generous way of being that includes lots and lots of people. Lots anyway, but not all. Lots but not all. So for me, uh, modernisms are about precisely what matters even now, and it's poetry as process. It's not necessarily referring to outside. It's looking at itself as this great endeavor, and that's the way modernism works. Whoa. No, but. Uh, well, I would just add to that that if you're talking about the multiplicity of the self, instantly you think of Apollinaire. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is the je tu il. Right, he is in the in the text that you have, Zone, which is his great text. He's split into a into a multiplicity of pronouns to begin with, and places, and we'll talk about that when we get there. But I mean, it would seem to me that his calligram, which we didn't bring, which are poems that are that look like what they're talking about. I don't know if you've seen them, but. There's one that's called It's Raining, and the verses are going like this down the page. He has one about a watch, which is, which is written like a watch, etc. cetera. Um, that is clearly a, a precursor to the language poets and concrete poetry and, you know, all kinds of other modernisms. And I, I mean, I think Apollinaire was self-consciously modern. Yeah. Right? He was, he's the guy who called Christ an aviator. I mean, he, you know, that's so, it seems to me he's quintessential in any discussion of modernism. And he even has that poem called Victoire, and you know, we're, we're leaving behind everything in the past. Right. Now, and, and Zone, which of course includes all zones, it's kind of globalism before globalism took, took shape. Right. Maybe we should turn to Madame May, though, before sure. we go too much into Polina. <clears throat> and I would add that the reason that I, I said lots and not all before was we were, we were just mentioning this um, before we began talking, that um, when I choose poets to teach, um, Polina is almost never on my list. Um, and. Um, and I hope you'll convince me tonight. I do believe that he's quintessential. I believe he is um, the right choice for tonight. But I, Malarmé is somebody that I agree with Marianne 100%, that he is absolutely speaks to us today more than ever. Um, and he is the first poet that would be on any syllabus I would create. But for some reason, I, Apollinaire doesn't do it for me. And I hope that tonight I will be able to that's fascinating. So we'll talk more about that. Um, but OK, let's turn to Mallarmé. Yes, and Nancy's going to read. OK. So you want me to read the English and the I think the English and yes. the French. OK. Uh, this is a translation by Patricia Terry and Maurice Schroeder. Will new and alive the beautiful today? Will new and alive the beautiful today shatter with a blow of drunken wing this hard lake? Forgotten, haunted under rhyme by the transparent glacier, flights unflown. A swan of long ago remembers now that he, magnificent but lost to hope, is doomed for having failed to sing the realms of life when the ennui of sterile winter gleamed. His neck will shake off the white torment space inflicts upon the bird for his denial, but not this horror, plumage trapped in ice. Phantom by brilliance captive to this place, immobile, he assumes disdain's cold dream, which in his useless exile robes the swan. Le Vierge, le Vivace et le Bel Aujourd'hui. Le Vierge, le Vivace et le Bel Aujourd'hui, va-t-il nous déchirer d'un coup d'aile ivre ce lac dur oublié que hante sous le givre le transparent glacier des vols qui n'ont pas fui Un signe d'autrefois se souvient que c'est lui, magnifique, mais qui sans espoir se délivre pour n'avoir pas chanté la région où vivre 
quand du stérile hiver a resplendi l'ennui. Tout son col se courait, se court à cette blanche agonie par l'espace infligé à l'oiseau qui le nie, mais non l'horreur du sol où le plumage est pris. Fantôme qu'à ce lieu son pur éclat assigne, il s'immobilise au songe froid de mépris que V parmi l'exil inutile le signe. One of the first things we notice when you read is the significance of the E sound, of course, at the end of every line. Now, when that, uh, that can't be captured in the translation. So as a non-translator to two extraordinary translators, what do you do about that? Despair. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> I think they did a pretty good job, don't you? But they couldn't do that. Uh, this right. poem has been translated a thousand times, and everybody gets different things in it. But it seems to me that, you know, as a translator, maybe you can't get that, but then you get something else. Yeah, okay. that's what you try to do. And you want people to read the French. So, I mean, I refuse to do any translation that doesn't have a, you know, the French and the English. And you want people to look back at the original language, which is the point. Hmm. Okay. Um, another question that I would have for you about the translation, then I'll leave you alone about the translation and we'll go into. Um, as I was looking at both of these, I was struck by um, Par l'espace infligé à l'oiseau qui le nie in the second to la, in the penultimate um, strophe. Um, why there's a uh, Transferal from the passive to the active voice there. Um, the, par l'espace infligé, inflicts upon the bird. Am I making any sense? Oh, you're looking at, well, this and this. In the, in the French? In the translation. Oh, in the translation, okay. That's true, and there's another transfer, which is in the last line. Which, of uh, course, in the French says right. that the senior, which I'll get back to, uh, clothes himself right. and not, and not uh, robes the swan. Robes the but swan. And yet that's I, such a beautiful line, robes the swan. It's beautiful. It but is. so that's well, the that's point. So right. there you right. are. Right. Okay. Right. That, Perfect example. Right. I mean, you can't get le signe in English right. and all that it means, right? Which is presumably what you're going to tell us about, right? I can tell you about that, which is, I guess, is pretty clear. When, when you look at the second stanza here, look at the French, un signe, so it says a swan, and then in the final line, what of course happens is that it becomes the swan, and signe, of course, sounds like sign, and so this entire, absolutely entire sonnet that we call the white sonnet is about how the swan becomes the sign, and how the sign, last word, triumphs over everything else, and it's been this poem has been analyzed by every single person you've ever heard of. But one of my favorite, uh, which I still, one of the favorite, my favorite uh, analyses of it is that you have the writing here uh, of the white on the lake, and you also have the writing of the stars in the sky as they are reflected. The sign is reflected up there, and so forth and so forth. I love, I was just thinking of it tonight, I love very much the fact that mais non l'horreur du sol où le plumage est pris. The sol, of course, isn't just a lake, it's also the earth, so it's all about the sign being stuck in this earthly domain and not somehow transfigured. But you want to say a word about impotence here, right? <laughs> I can feel well, when we were <laughs> <laughs> I always think of this sonnet as being about impotence, of yes. course. I mean, of course. the swan is frozen into the lake and can't get it up, so to speak, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't know that we say it like that in literary <laughs> gatherings, but that... <laughs> um, I don't know. It seems to me this is the greatest poem I know about being blocked. That you know, and that it's, it's all about writer's block, and but it's written, and it's written as a question: Can today, yeah, la belle aujourd'hui, can it get rid of what ha hasn't happened in the past? Can it somehow 
put the sign in flight. So I think uh, the reason, I don't just think the reason, I know that the reason I picked the next poem, which is The Clown Chastise, is because you have the virgin coming back, you have the purity coming back, and you have the glacier coming back. So it's, mm -hmm. as I read it, a kind of response, a very peculiar and sad and incredibly complicated response to this. So maybe we could just go um, to that one. Yeah. One quick question. Sure. Why did we not include, it occurs to me now, Prise Marine, um, which is so often paired well, with... Well, because it's so Baudelairean, because it, he hasn't forgotten uh, La Clarté de Lorraine. Right. Yeah. So I thought maybe unless we were going to talk about Baudelaire. Okay. But that's true. Brise Marine, uh, which is about setting sail and somehow leaving his child and the nursing wife behind, it's a terribly uh, Baudelarian thing. Do you want to read it? You want me to read it? Uh, if you like. Um... It's, I translated it uh, as everybody else in the world has translated it, and you never feel you're really quite getting it. It's one of those Malawi poems you don't get. But the reason that it is so um, transfiguringly <laughs> taught in every single class is because we never got over Baudelaire. It's impossible to have gotten over Baudelaire. So he's stuck right here in the middle of... the chronology of the, uh, Prise Marine is 1865, and... Uh, Le Vierge de Vivace is what year? I have no idea. I know we know one date in all of French literature. It does seem to me that this, <laughs> that Brise Marine is a response, 1913? <laughs> is, that, is that your oh, you date? you want to know what date I know? 1885. Oh, that's a good one. That's a very good one. 1913 is another good one. Okay, if you'd like to read Brise Marine, because I, th I think of Brise Marine as a, as a response to le vierge, le vivace et le belge. Okay, I'll just read it, uh, obviously, here in French. La chair est triste, hélas, et j'ai lu tous les livres. Fuir, là-bas, fuir. Je sens que des oiseaux sont ivres d'être parmi l'écume inconnue et les cieux. It has to do with everybody, you know, with flesh being sad, and I've read everything, and I just want to get the hell away, is really what it says. Rien. I love it. This, the, the next line begins with nothing. Wonderful. Rien, ni les vieux jardins reflétés par les yeux ne retiendra ce cœur que dans la mer se trompe. In short, I just want to get away. Which, of course, is awfully Baudelarian if you think of le voyage and all those things. Oh, nuit, oh, nights. This is desperately, of course, romanticism seen through the eyes of Baudelaire. Ni la clarté des herbes de ma lampe sur le vide papier que la blancheur défend. Ni la jeune femme, elle est en son enfant. You know, his wife has a child and I want to get away from all that. I just want to leave Stima, and so he wants to leave. And then it ends, and I'll just read you the end, which is very, very beautiful and sad. Yeah. Maybe if I went away, maybe. Un ennui désolé par les cruels espoirs, crois encore à la Dieu suprême des mouchoirs, when you're waving your handkerchief, so you're going off, you know, you're leaving. Et peut-être, and here we get to the sad part, les mains invitant les orages, maybe those masts of the sailboats, which are just calling storms upon themselves. Maybe they are this kind and so forth, maybe not. Perdu, everything is lost, without any sails, without any masts, without any fertile isles. And here goes the famous last poem, the last line. Mais oh mon cœur, entend le chant des matelots. Oh my heart, listen to the song of the sailors. So it's all about wanting to get away, which of course he doesn't. I mean, the poor guy taught English and everybody teased him mercilessly for having written, you know, l'azur, 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 the blue, the blue, the blue, the blue. And his students laughed at him all the time and he hated it. Very sad. Okay, um, let me just tell you what the next poem is about and maybe read you some of it. But it's the clown chastise is not the way it originally was. The, what you, the French that you have on the sheet, if you have this French, is the second version. It's impossible. He has deliberately begun with the most impossible word you can begin with a French poem. You. I mean, no French person would ever begin a poem. You. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, right? Uh, I'll read you the, of course, brilliant translation since I did it, of course. Eyes. 
I mean, even in English. I mean, can you imagine starting a poem with eyes? You eyes. Lakes with my simple passion to be reborn other than the actor evoking with gestures for feather the ugly suit of stage lights. I have pierced a window in the canvas wall, and I'll just talk about it as I go so we won't have to go back over it. Uh, this is, of course, about performance. This is a very exciting performance poem, which is about a clown and a circus, and what happens is the clown dives up through the wall, the canvas wall, and he plunges into the water. And there's where the tragedy takes place. This is, again, enormously Baudelarian, as you will hear. Clear, tra uh, clear traitor swimmer with my legs and arms, leaping and bounding, denying the wrong Hamlet, still about being an actor, right? As if I created in the way of a thousand tombs in which to verge and disappear. And here comes the Vierge back. Joyous gold of the symbol, fists of inflame. Suddenly the, the sun strikes the barrenness pure, exhaled from my coolness like mother of pearl. Stale night of the skin when you swept over me ungrateful, ignorant of my whole consecration, that grease paint drowned in faithless glacier water. This is where the glacier come back. So he never really gets away from this Baudelarian sense of the poet trapped forever. Whatever's going to happen is going to be bad. Like, you know, Baudelaire's poem, The Albatross, in which the, the point is too big to make any sense on the real world, so he just gets stuck on the, on the um, deck of a ship. I'll read it to you in French. Sort of. You. Lac avec ma simple ivresse de renaître autre que l'histrion qui du geste évoqué comme plume la suie ignoble des quinquets. J'ai trouvé dans le mur de toile une fenêtre. What he's trying to be is something other than an actor, of course, with the stage lights in front of him and all that soot that sweeps over you. So the whole thing has to do with dirt and then sweeping off the dirt. And the dirt, of course, turns out to be what was the real. So the cosmetic thing is the real thing, as in Baudelaire, and the thing under what you've hidden is the false thing. De ma jambe et des bras limpides, nageurs traîtres, à bon multiplié, reniant le mauvais Hamlet. C'est comme si dans l'onde j'innovais mille sépulcres pour y vierge disparaître. Vierge, because he's going to sweep off all the cosmetics and find out that that was what he really was. Il a hors de cymbal à des points irrités. Tout d'un coup, le soleil frappe la nudité qui pure s'exhala de ma fraîcheur de nacre. Rends ce nuit de la peau quand sur moi vous passiez, ne sachant pas ingrat, and this is the point, que c'était tout mon sacre, ce phare noyé dans l'eau perfide des glaciers. So what happens is the erasure of the poet and of the clown who, whom the poet has become, because he takes the, the drowning in the water, he takes off all that cosmetic that he was wearing, you know, actor's grease paint, which is what it's about. So the performance turns out to be impossible uh, as a as a thing except as a negative thing. The performance is the real thing, but what he wants to get to is the real. This is, this is like modernism. You want to ask me one poem that's modernist? This poem, because it's about performance and it's about itself as a performance of what's impossible. It's always what you don't have. It's, it's the other side of Le Vierge, Le Vivace, I think. The you followed by luck is such a powerful juxtaposition. It's really magnificent. And it's a tease on those of you who know French poetry. Alas, Lamartine begins the most famous poem, O oh, Lac. Mm -hmm. So this is a play on O oh, Lakes, you know, and then it's about O oh, Time and everything. So this is, this is romanticism redone through the eyes of Baudelaire into symbolism, into the tragedy of a performance that's always going to be the impossible. Good. Okay, Nancy, do you want to add anything? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> I'll talk about Apollinaire, okay? okay? Okay. Yummy. He's very yummy, Apollinaire. Well, before we move on to Apollinaire, maybe anybody oh. in the audience would like to ask a question um, about either of these two texts? I just had a very simple question. Why is Swan capitalized? Because he becomes, he begins as a swan, like a swan. And Le Signe then becomes the sign, Le Signe, same word, which englobes the whole everything. So he goes from being a swan to being the sign, the swan. 
So the whole poem is a development, as I see it at least, from the, the initial question, can we get out of this impossibility, to the answer, well, we can only by the sign, which is poetry. So that actually, Le Vierge, Le Vivace, to me, is a very positive poem. It says, maybe today will vanquish yesterday because, because the sign will take over. The poem, as it's... <coughs> Because it's the, 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 also the, the indefinite article that precedes it, but that goes to the definite article. We go from A to the. It's not only the small C that becomes a large C. Right? Because a specific un, a swan, un signe, becomes le signe, the big thing. The big thing. Yeah. The big thing. Yeah. Yes, uh, a couple of comments. First of all, about the difficulty of translating issues that come up. For example, if you just take the very title of the poem, Le Vierge, Virgule, Le Vivace, et Le Bel Aujourd'hui, Point de Suspension. Absolutely. Okay? So the very first word is the Vierge, Virgin. That has, unfortunately, or for whatever reason, been left out of the translation. Then there's a comma. So already you stop then. And then you have trois points de suspension at the end, sort of leaving you a little bit uncertain of what's going to happen. This is just a sort of subtleties yes. and how difficult it is. Absolutely. Then the last word of the first stanza, le transparent glacier des vols qui n'ont pas fui. Now the English translation is flights unflown, whereas the French word fui implies an escape, Flight. fleeing, yeah. which is again a different image. Okay, so that's but that you can't avoid that. Now, as an analyst, uh, comment a little uh, about Malamé. Uh, reading, I haven't read a whole lot about his biography, but it turns out that uh, he lost his mother when he was five, that a sister he lost when he was about 15, and that his father died when he was 17. And his son died. And his son and died. His son died. Right. Okay. So death surrounds him. Now, I have some patients who've lost a child, uh, who've lost a father when they were five. And, you, and in their association, in their thinking, there are certain recurrent themes and ideas. One of them is the absence, okay? So that's the, the second one here, the theme of glacier and the swan caught in the glacier, I think has to do not only with the poetical inhibition, but also with death. And death surrounds the second, the second poem. So I think that, the only point I want to make is that, uh, and also the search for ideal, and, and the heavens, the sky for my patient was very important because he thought that his father was in heaven as a child and would talk to him. So the only point I want to make about bringing these things together is it seems to me that some knowledge of the artist's biography can be helpful in giving you not the clue, but giving you additional ideas about some of the personal meanings that these would have for the poet. And for us, the reader, I think it's helpful to know. And I'd be interested in your reaction. Not only that, but everybody he loved and lost, they were all called Marie. <laughs> all of them. I mean, really. Which is kind of interesting. And all the biographies of Mallarmé, and there are many, uh, the best one I think, if anybody needs to know, is Steinmetz. It's very, very long, but it, it has, you know, page after page about Maria and Marie and what happens to the Virgin thing in this. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Question: Is the Swan constellation? Also. Yes. That's why writing on the sky, white against the stars, against the blackness and the blackness of the swan, because of course the black swan and you know, all that, uh, the, the tradition of that, into the white glacier. Absolutely, it's, well, it's true. There are the times that constellations exist not in space and time as well, and they're their fabrications and they're Absolutely. enormously powerful. Mm -hmm. and that's Thank you, yeah, that's true. Over writing, yeah. reason for the capital thing. Great point, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Marianne, I want to ask, do you take in consideration the things I mentioned, like things in the post slide, to help you understand the poem, or as a more literary person, do you think this is secondary? I actually believe both of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I don't think the author died. I don't believe in the death of the author. But uh, I understand that theory, and I try to use it sometimes. But in the case of Mallarmé, well, I guess in every case, but especially in the case of Mallarmé, I think it is important. Yes. Mary, what did you mean when you said the two poems diametrically opposed? Oh, well, because I read Le Vierge, Le Vivace, uh, and those adjectives, of course, modified today, which is very important, you know. Um, I take this as a kind of answer to the question, can we get over what's happened in the past? And I would say yes. And then I read the other poem as, yeah, but guess what? What we are surrounding ourselves with is what's going to get washed off, because we can't be other than the actor. We can't be other than our performing selves. So I see the second one as more negative than than our famous white sonnet. I, I don't think this is a positive poem. No, right? I know. So that not that... I, I really modernism. don't. I think this is complete despair. I think it's white, sterile, trapped. You know, and, and this... Horse, as he said. And uh, totally about, about yeah. absolute immobility mm -hmm. and being blocked as a writer. And, and you can say that, that this capitalization at the end... You see, I, I mean, to me, it, it, it renders the sign even more terrifying. Mm -hmm. You right. could read that capital that way, too. To say nothing of the scorn, because what he's putting on is a clothing of scorn. Now, what is that mm -hmm. scorn for? Is and a cold dream of yeah. scorn. I mean, I, 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 think it's, I, I think it's, you know, like death. As, yeah. I think it's a, it's, it, it is yeah. a complete portrait of the poet dead, you know, and but alive, kind of like a, like a fish trapped in ice. You like know, like vivas, you know, vivas. That, that I don't know whether you would agree with this, but uh, I think it's really very modernist in its awareness, uh, as you said, of um, itself. And by that, I mean, I think it's not only about death and it's not, I don't see so much affect in it about loss and, and despair. I see actually the, um, in a sense, the absence of that. I see yeah, that no, I the, the frigidity yeah. of art uh -huh. that sterilizes the in the senior and the senior, the um, what might be an affective experience and immobilizes it. It's the terror of what art can do to what is otherwise dynamic and alive by immobilizing it. But immortalizing it. Too. Yeah, but this is the only way that it can be written, right? That is, which is sound, why I mean, it, I mean, what what I hear you saying is that art is killing here. Well, which that is, it doesn't I, actually. This, it seems to me it, this is like an ice sculpture. You know, it is. But I, when you think of something that it crystallizes, mm. it's not only the crystal; it's the action of crystallizing yes, something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what. Yes. Then is he lamenting something? I think different, he different time or the, the past. Well, as Marianne said, I th different, or more perfect, at a different time. I think he's lamenting what wasn't <clears throat> more perfect. Yes, you would agree with that. Uh, Nothing uh, happened. It didn't happen. I got stuck in the ice. Like, will, will it happen change? today? Will it change today? Right. Probably not. But it says vivas. The only, I mean, I'm just tonight thinking it's positive. Never in my life thought it was positive before. But I, <laughs> true. But I do want to point out the second, after Le Vierge, Le Vivas. I mean, that's pretty, li that's pretty lively, right, Vivas? Maybe today will rescue us. There's no so answer. So it's the search of the artist? Oh, yeah. Very oh, much yeah. so. Oh, Very he's much so. He's found, lost, or found anything. Mm -hmm. He's just, it's just forever. Well, there he is in front of the blank page trying to put something down on paper as a poet, and it's that moment of terror before you know that if you, the moment you put those letters down, you are um, reifying something 
And ruining the blankness of the page. And ruining, ruining the blankness the of the page. Raw poetry is something that you, you can't explain in words almost. I mean, yes, in words. And if you think back to the poem Brise Marine that Lois was talking about and that I read a little of, oh gosh, I wish I could leave. Oh, mon cœur, entend le chant des matelots, listen to them singing. But he doesn't leave, of course. Oh, you see, I sterile. read that poem very it's differently, funny. actually. He can't leave. He hears them, but he can't leave. I'm in tears. I know I was in tears. <laughs> <laughs> Your poet. I'm moved. Actually, I'm not. I'm, I'm a stage well, director, and I never teach, mind. I teach Shakespeare. Yeah. Your point. Well, there you go. To this, and uh, I do cry at opera and things like that. Mm -hmm. And when I read something, <laughs> yeah, but this is but, a beautiful scent, and this is something so um, restored, and, and you can't touch it. It's something can't be touched, but it's so, it's so can't be grasped or so even understood. To <laughs> Sorry. I, I'd like to go back to your question about the role of biography and interpretation. You know, for a while that was completely verboten. I, I mean, if you were a new critic, it was absolutely forbidden that you take into account biography. And yeah, no tenure. <laughs> right. Um, I, because I've always been a writer as well as an academic, I knew that I existed, you know, <laughs> and that what happened in what I wrote in, was my life was in my writing. So it never made much sense to me to deny that biography was of any use. Um, this said, I think you can read this text without knowing that Mallarmé lost for dear people, right? I mean, I think you don't need to know anything more than what's on this page, but it's enriched. It's, it's given depth. It's given poignancy to me, because here is this man who suffered so intensely, and what he's writing about is frigidity and immobility and whiteness, you know? I think the question is not so much what we know of the biography, but what we do with what yes, we know exactly. of the biography. Yes, exactly. That only comes with your biography, with your biography, the person who is reading it. We, 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 each one of us has a biography, and we watch the other person and compare our biography to the other biography. It's impossible to do an abstract idea, uh, because we, we're not abstract. I mean, I deal with this all the time directly. Theater is a little different from poetry, I think. Poetry can be abstract in a certain way that theater cannot, because there's actual, there's a person there with flesh on her bones, you know? Sometimes. That's another conversation. <laughs> I think we have to let you read a poem. Okay. We're going to have to move on, but Ed, I, I, I am not so sure. Uh, there is no question that when you read a biography of whoever, you're going to make connections to whatever they've written because you can't escape yourself in writing. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand what the benefit is necessarily of doing that in appreciating or understanding or reacting to a poem. I don't see what you gain from it. From, I, but from ignoring the biography or no, taking it into account? For knowing no, the biography. No. In other words, the reaction one has to this poem and the way one understands it, as you yourself said, one would have without having mm. the facts that uh, Frank was talking about. So I think in a way, it's, to my mind, it's better to forget the biography and appreciate the work of art as the work of art. I well, think you should always read the text before knowing. Mm. I would insist yes. on that. And then know. And yes, then I would agree. And then go back to the text. But start with and, it. And forget. Know and then forget and go back to the text. I would to the extent the that you can. I agree I with you 100%. But if we don't move on to Apollina, we will never. I just wanted to say that I don't know how you could possibly ignore the biography of Mallarmé. Because it's so <laughs> this is not an abstract didn't come from some <clears throat> way that it just kind of created itself. It came through the total context of someone's experience. But the perception. That's a given. Yes. Maybe but I better stop to this. I think <laughs> we don't need his biography. We just 
It reflects, it, his story reflects the armor. We don't need to know his facts. But we're attracted to it because it touches our facts. I think can I just open one parenthesis about that and then I'll shut up, which is Malak May said where the whole stage is in the mind. And he wrote this whole play called Iji Tu, totally unreadable and everything, as <laughs> lots of Malak May is. And he said, tout cela se passe dans la tête. And that was his stage, was the mind. Amazing. He also said, however, <laughs> if I may just throw in one thing that he said, ce n'est point avec des idées qu'on fait des sonnets de gars, c'est avec des mots. And that's a really magnificent and important point that you don't make you don't make poetry with ideas, you make poetry with words. And I think that answers also what Frank the question that Frank raised, which brings me to what Marianne said, which is that she agrees and doesn't agree at the same time. And I think that's a very valuable point. I don't think she was being flip in the least. I think that her answer is very genuine. And I agree with it 100%. And last question, and then we go to Apolina. Just a point about yeah. biographical criticism and its uses, because this is also my business. Um, I use the sources. Obviously, I use the biographies. How could I not? And yet, you have another life that's similar to Malamede's, who didn't, and yet he didn't write the poetry. And so in the end, you can't just draw these traceries and say this caused that, because right. another light, very similar to Malamaze, didn't produce in the least that effect. Yeah. So. And you can't ignore the associations of the reader. OK, moving on to Apudi now. Nancy. Well, I, I, how should we do this? Marianne was going to read Le Pont Mirabeau. Which is light compared to zone. So let's. Well, it's also light compared to Le Signe. But well, we're not going to be able to read all of zone. No, no, we're sure. not going to read uh, all of zone. I think that I should just read the French of Le Pont Mirabeau and say to you that the most exciting thing about it is the last line, which is also the refrain, okay? Which is. Je. Who in this poem is speaking? The excitement of this poem isn't just the way it sounds, and you can hear Apollinaire reading it in 1913. You can hear him reading like this in French against the, the <laughs> metro, and you hear, Bien à la nuit, à la. I won't read it like that. But um, if you look at the French and you see that the point is, Who is Je demeure? And I'll read it quickly. Sous le pont Mirabeau coule la Seine et nos amours. Faut-il qu'il m'en souvienne la joie venait toujours? Après la peine, vienne la nuit, sonne l'heure, les jours s'en vont, je demeure. Les mains dans les mains, restons face à face, tandis que sous le pont de nos bras passent des éternels regards, longs de si las. And that's that child's game, you know, when you have uh, one arm and the other arm, and then, you know, you go under it. London Bridge, I think we call it. Vienne la nuit, sonne l'heure, les jours s'en vont, je demeure. L'amour s'en va comme cette eau courante, l'amour s'en va comme la vie est lente, et comme l'espérance est violente. Vienne la nuit, sonne l'heure, les jours s'en vont, je demeure. Passe les jours et passe les semaines, ni temps passé, ni les amours reviennent. Sous le pont Mirabeau coule la Seine. Vienne la nuit, sonne l'heure, les jours s'en vont, je demeure. So the question is, is the jeu the bridge or is it the poem? I think that I tend, or the poet, I tend to believe it's the poem. So we could go to Zoom, maybe. Well, it's a haunting refrain. It's very melodic. It's clear, and that's why it's essential to hear it read aloud. So thank you. Nancy, you want to comment on it, or you want to read from Zone? Um, let's go on to Zone, OK? Yes. I mean, I think it's a more difficult and oh, yeah. complicated poem. And big. And big. Such a big poem. Um, for those of you who, who enjoy biography, Apollinaire was an illegitimate child. Of the Pope, maybe? Something. Yeah, he went around saying he had been, his father was a high, <laughs> a, 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 you know, a star of the church. Uh, he, he was born of a Polish mother who, in, and he was born in Rome. And then they moved here and there and the other place to various casino towns. Um, he was never recognized by his father, whoever that was. When he was, I think, 18, they moved to Paris. 
uh, and he had a series of, you know, crappy jobs, one of which was being a tutor to some countess's daughter who took him for a year to Germany where he fell in love with the British governess who was discovered centuries later in Texas by Leroy C. Brunig, um, who, my professor at Barnard. <laughs> um, well, that's why I love Apollinaire, because Brunig was my man, you know. Um, but he became, he then came back from Germany and, and fell in with painters. And that's, so he was part of the, the bateau lavoir scene with Durin, Vlaminck, you know, Les Fauves, Picasso. He coined the term um, surrealism. surrealism. That's, that was invented by Apollinaire. He was an art critic. Uh, and he supported himself for, for I beg your pardon. That's why I keep on thinking they're mo moving furniture, you know, and I realize it's me. Um, he supported himself by writing porn pornography, among other things, at one point. So, it's Vierge. <laughs> right? From Vierge to Vierge, right? That's a dirty joke for those of you who don't know French. Anyway, so here is Zone, which is one of the great. Um, the great modernist texts. Um, and I, maybe I should tell you that Zone refers to a, a, um, a zone which has been cleared for construction. So in fact, one could interpret this as be, meaning the future. Okay? And I'm just going to read like the first few lines and the last few lines. À la fin, tu es là de ce monde ancien. Bergère aux tours Eiffel, le troupeau des ponts belle ce matin. Tu en as assez de vivre dans l'antiquité grecque et romaine. Ici même, les automobiles ont l'air d'être anciennes. La religion seule est restée toute neuve. La religion est restée simple, comme les hangars de port aviation. I should read that in English. I'm sorry. I forgot to. I, uh, I don't know if you, you have the Ron the Paget. I'm, I'm going to read the Ron Paget, Paget translation he here. OK, and, and if you don't have it, you should look it up. Um, I'll just read you those lines that I just read. Zone, you're tired of this old world at last. The flock of bridges is bleating this morning, O oh, shepherdess Eiffel Tower. You've had enough of living in the Greek and Roman past. Even the cars look ancient here. Only religion has stayed new. Religion has stayed simple, like the hangars at Port Aviation. Uh, and then I will read you the, the end, and we'll, we can stop in the middle sometime, too. But um, I'm going to. That's me. That's Sorry. you. Sorry. That's, Sorry. I knew it wasn't me. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's very impressive. It really is. It's reality imposing itself, you know. Um, I'm going to start with, and you drink this alcohol. Do you see that? It's about eight lines from the bottom, from the, the end. First? No, I was going to read the English first and then, and then the, the French, French right? right? Okay. Well, that's how we started. Right. Okay. Maybe I'll start with night slips away. Night slips away like a lovely half-breed. It's false Ferdine or attentive Leah. And you drink this alcohol that burns like your spirit. Your spirit you drink down like spirits. You walk toward Auteuil. You want to go home on foot to sleep among fetishes from Oceania and Guinea, which put Christ in another form with other inspirations. They are inferior Christs of dark aspirations. Goodbye and God keep you. Sun throat, sun throat cut. Now, you can't. Uh, no translation can do the do justice to the French. But anyway, I'm going to, um, I'll just read you those lines in French. La nuit s'éloigne ainsi qu'une belle métive, c'est Ferdine la fausse ou Léa l'attentive, et tu bois cet alcool brûlant comme ta vie. 
ta vie que tu bois comme une eau de vie. Tu marches vers Auteuil, tu veux aller chez toi à pied, dormir parmi tes fétiches d'Océanie et de Guinée. Ils sont des Christ d'une autre forme et d'une autre croyance. Ce sont les Christ inférieurs des obscures espérances. Adieu, adieu, soleil cou coupé. Um, it's that, la I just don't see how you can do those last two lines well, in adieu, English. Adieu, is, uh, adieu, you know, means goodbye, but it has God in it, and this is a poem about the loss of God. And, um, you know, and that, that rising sun, like, a, like an amputated head, um, is astonishing, and, and I don't... It, throat cut or slit throat? Well, I have or four what? translations. One is sun slit throat, and one is farewell, farewell, sun slit throat. Then uh, the sun, a severed neck. Mm. And Samuel Beckett, in honor of Lois, put sun corseless neck, because coarse used to be the word for neck, so it goes sun neckless neck, in order to cut the in order to get the repetition of coup coupé, he used necklace neck, if you see what I mean. Not Except that anybody understands what heard of the word corseless But that's so. why I did it. That's that's nice. Nice. How that's irritating. Nice. <laughs> um, tell me how much you look at other translations when you're translating. I never do. I do after I've done what I've yeah, done. Yeah, after you've after. done it. And do you find yourself making modifications or not as a result? Trying not to plagiarize, uh, but if I've gotten something really wrong, I do. I even use footnotes, I hate to say, in my translations mm -hmm. when I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Footnotes of what? To other translations. Oh, translations. I say someone has done this better than I have. This is what I've done. But, you know, X does this. If it's a, if it's a university press, trans, you know, publishing it. Right. Depends who's publishing right. it. This, I have no, no, I did this, no footnotes. No. So maybe, Nancy, you can situate Zone in terms of the larger picture of Apollinaire's work for us, aesthetically and historically? Um, I am particularly interested in Apollinaire's prose. Mm -hmm. Have you ever read his Some. stories? Some, not a lot. Um, and after years of reading Apollinaire and not really finding anything interesting to say about him, I got myself into a situation where I had to write because I was about to present what I had to write at the MLA. Right. There's nothing like that for getting you to write. Mallarmé, you know, if he'd had that situation, he might not have been stuck in the lake, right? Um, And, I dis and it happened that I was in the process of getting a divorce that summer, and suddenly I realized that Apollinaire's work is strewn with amputations. Um, this, is, this was the moment when I decided everything we write is autobiographical, no matter how deeply couched in Derridian terms it might be. Um, his, it, uh, the body is always coming apart in his prose. And indeed, Soleil Cou Coupé, and, which is one of his most famous poems, ends with an amputation. Um, I think that this is, that this is counterbalanced in his work by a kind of proliferation of body parts and bodies so that uh, he has in his prose particularly but even in, in his poetry he has a number of characters who are ubiquitous they're everywhere all at the same time um, and so there's, there's this kind of spectrum between coming apart at the seams and gradually losing pieces of yourself and amassing more and more and more pieces of yourself. And there's a famous poem, um, oh, what's it, Cortege, mm -hmm. where he talks about, I looked for myself, and here came all my friends bringing pieces of myself, and they put me together, you know? And I think this is a poem about coming apart at the seams. It seems to me that, um, that that's what happens in the course of this poem, that by the end of the poem, Everything is kind of 
it's fragmenting, you know? It's fragments, and it's much denser in the beginning of this poem, where um, he's tired of the, of the ancient world, of the old world. That was me. Um, the only thing that remains new is religion. And I think perhaps there's a, there's a line in the middle that, actually it's the top of page two of my French version, where he's talking about Christ uh, who, who ascends into the sky better than aviators. Il détient le record du monde pour la hauteur. He holds the world's record for height. Uh, Pupi Christ de l'œil. There we go back to les yeux, right? Vingtième pupille des siècles, il sait y faire. Um, et changer en oiseau, ce siècle comme Jésus monte dans l'air. There you have a constellation of, of religious imagery where Christ is the most modern. He's the, he's the best aviator the world has ever known, which makes him the most modern. Um, and I think you could say that this, this pupil, I don't know how it's translated. How is, how Any is that? Any of these four people? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's about... Pupil Christ of the eye. Pupil Christ of the eye. Well, that's literal. That's okay. 20th pupil of the centuries, he knows how to do it there. Mm. And changed into a bird, this century, like Jesus, rises in the air. I'll tell you, one of the reasons I like this Paget translation is because he rhymes. I mean, he, that's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it really works most of the time. And he, seems by the way, me. says this is the, he's a wonderful translator, wonderful poet. This is the work he's the proudest of. So he was, I promised I would, we would share it with you tonight. So it's the year you know what? 1912. Know. Thank you very much. So we really can't uh, separate that entirely from what was going on around him in 1912. And, and he was a soldier and he loved the war, I hate to tell you. Yeah, and he, he was died of a head wound. Yeah. Yeah. He d in fact, the, the, there, here's a biographical story, okay? He died of his head wound, which he had been suffering from for months, uh, on the day of the armistice. And the streets beneath his apartment were filled with crowds of joyous Frenchmen shouting, Abba Guillaume, which meant, you know, down with Wilhelm. But of course, Apollinaire was Guillaume. And so as he was dying, he heard everyone cursing him. That's the way he went out. A cheery death. Yes. Well, the thing is that one of his novels is called The Poet Assassinated. Right. And indeed, he associates himself with Orpheus, you know, who got torn apart by the Furies, and whose head was severed and floated down the river singing. And I think, I think that this is, this is a central image for Apollinaire. You know, that he's in pieces. His head has been cut off, but he's singing as he goes, you know. Um, it seems to me that this pupille Christ de l'œil, that the reason, maybe, God or religion is, is modern is because it changes. It is, a, it is a kind of vision, which is what this pupil of the eye is talking about. It changes from century to century, and therefore it can remain new, unlike the rest of the world around him. However, yeah, that's right. Did I get that right? <laughs> um, however, he's lost his faith. So here you have this paradox of the poet who sees Christ as the greatest aviator in the world, but it's of no use to him. Um, and as this poem goes on with his wandering from place to place to place, as he did in his life, and he associates himself with the wandering Jew in various texts, he comes apart. And, and the whole poem takes place, I think, wandering around the periphery of Paris, right? And he talks, in, in this poem there is a central scene, 
in the, in the, on the first page of his staying awake all night praying in front of the blue flame of, of Christ. And of course, on the last page, he's stayed awake all night long drinking, uh, humiliating his mouth. That's a line that was not... I have yet to see a good translation of this. You know, his, so that you have the two sleepless nights, the one in happiness and faith in front of the blue flame, and then the lost, wandering poet who gradually falls apart. And when the sun finally rises, it's decapitated. Um, but here is a line um, just, just above the ending of the poem that I read, which is about humiliating his mouth. J'humilie maintenant à une pauvre fille au rire horrible ma bouche. Which literally, if I understand this, means I, I hum, now I humiliate my mouth against or on or with a poor girl with a horrible laugh or a poor prostitute. A fee is a prostitute also. But none of these translations, did just, not even Ron Padgett did a good job. Um, before we get to the bad jobs, I just want to remind you. <laughs> that Nancy said in the beginning, and it's incredibly important about the multiplicity of personality, this morning I saw you are highly devout and all of that, and the I and the you somehow coalesce. So in a sense, to me, yes, he's fragmented, but somehow the, the poem is able to resume it all. But let me look up the translation of that. Well. What I would say is that reading the, the body of his work, so to speak, the conclusion that I come to is that all of these pieces of bodies that float through it and that he puts together or takes apart are really words. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that all of these characters in his stories who are really crazy, they're a crazy bunch, are also poems. And Poems can be cut. And in fact, the end of this poem is cut, right? Coupe is the last word. I, I was just thinking today, coming over here, that talking about um, putting together things and taking them apart, this to me makes this last line even more fascinating because coup coupe means neck cut but in the act of cutting it he's adding to it does that make sense to you it. Repeating and repeating it, it. Mm -hmm. so that in the in the very act of decapitating he's he's adding to it he's completing it or multiplying it i don't, I don't know how to say that i don't even know what i'm saying well, but just, i'm going to write an article that, about that, that. that. One preposition there that you alluded to a minute ago in that line, I'm stuck back there, if you'll yeah, forgive me. Je me dis maintenant un pauvre fille. How could you not see that as before, in front of, um, which adds to the humiliation, in front of her? Mm -hmm. the, the Shattuck translation is... And I think it's the best, actually. I humble my mouth by offering it to a poor slut with a horrible laugh. Okay. Say okay. That again? Would you read that again? I humble my mouth. Mm -hmm. I love it. I humble my mouth. Yeah, I, I, by offering it to a poor slut with a horrible laugh. That's different, though. It's entirely different. Entirely different. Well, because he he adds by offering to. I mean. Well, and humble. Um, is different. I think it's beautiful. I mean, that's right. It's humiliating. But somehow... It's, it's very different. Yeah. It's a very different meaning to humble or to humiliate. Yeah. Um, and who? what is being humiliated in front of whom and to whom and, and before whom? And I, I like think that the offering. I, I like 
Apollinaire doing this? <laughs> I mean, what they say about translating is really you have to be a poet and you have to, you are writing a new poem when you translate. Sure. Um, that, that's, we saw here tonight, I think, very much that that's very much the case. There's, you can't translate without being a poet, I don't think. You can't translate poetry without being a poet. It is a question of, of writing a new poem. There's no such thing as translating one poem to another language and leaving it as it is. Um, well, well, that was actually the theme we did. A translation round table here, and that was actually one of the things that was done with by Susan Joe Levine and the other growth and, and the other translator because they were trying to deal with literal yeah. you know, and, and there was the case of uh, there there's a case for instance I think David Mamet has done Chekhov and he doesn't read Russian. Yeah. But he takes a transliteration and then he take, then he that, that, that's his version of it. There are all kinds of themes and variations on this. Which is what Leishman did with Spanda doing Rilke. Yeah. Yeah. Spanda doesn't read German. Any questions on Apollinaire from or anything. I mean, anything. well, yes. The, I just, I would like to touch upon the visual arts as it relates mm. to some of the things that yeah. Very Mary and yes. Nancy and Rose have been talking about. There are two artists, one uh, early 20th century painter named Jean Elion, whose paintings deal with this, this idea, this crisis of cutting up and putting back together. And he represents injured soldiers in the streets of Paris, but then he uses the sleeping the sleeper on the park bench. Marianne, you'll have to fill in here because you saw that exhibition a couple of years ago at the National Academy. He looks at the, the bum on the park bench as a symbol of someone who has abandoned proper social mores, <coughs> but is also someone to be admired and looked up to. So this, this idea of bringing the pieces back to a whole that is admirable mm. and revivification of the Christ figure. And then as we were talking about Mallarmé, I realized that it was really through the work of Christopher Wilmark, who was a sculptor who died in the 1970s, who dedicated the last 10 years of his life to Mallarmé's poetry and to thinking it through, through his remarkable sculptures made of iron and glass. Mm -hmm. this, this, this idea of a glacier of transparency and translucence and passivity, all of these principles came into play. And after hearing this conversation tonight, I really want to go back and look at that work because it has helped me to understand that work in mm -hmm. Let me add a parenthesis about what you said, the, the first thing you said about, uh, about vision and the way that the, the line that we were talking about was translated in, in the Shattuck is Christ, pupil of the eye. So he, in a sense, becomes the disciple of vision as well as what we've already talked about. And I think that kind of translation, since we're talking about translation, since I'm a translator and I love doing that, is somehow it brings out more, maybe, than you would have thought was in the original. But every poet I've ever known, you know, of course, thinks it's wonderful when the translation brings out more. They don't like it when it brings out less. But, you know, Christ, pupil of the eye, seems to me just wonderful, that it's bringing somehow that vision into a, into a larger vision, about vision. We haven't actually done here, I don't think it would be an interesting idea for a round table, the, uh, the inspiration of verbal arts on the visual arts. Um, the, the, has, has that been? And the other way. And, and the other way, yes. The but first, I think that's, I mean. The first exhibition, literary, art and literary impulse. Yeah, yeah. It was, was a beginning of that, but that's certainly something yeah. I mean, there have been a, just thinking of Beckett, there have been a great number of artists who have, have so called illustrated his work without uh, illustrating his work, you know, um, who've done wonderful paintings and, you know. And the poems about Soutin and Chagall are immense. Yes. I was just reading yet another one today. Yeah. Yeah. Other comments? Questions? Well, uh, Holly? We had, we had a wonderful round table here uh, last year weeks ago, or last week, with Cody, Cody Walker, on, on uh, Whitman, and uh, Whitman as a collagist, you know, that, that, that uh, who was the, the, um, 
Scott Miller. Matt Miller is writing a book that's going to come out, and he showed how Whitman cut, you know, made all his journals and writings and then cut them up, and, and there are these facsimiles of, of the way he collaged it and the relationship of the Cubists and the Picasso's collages. And that way of thinking, again, a, a really a modernist way of thinking, which is uh, the way modernism was explained to me, I'm a visual artist, was that uh, you, you didn't look at a whole thing, you just took a piece of a thing and made that the subject rather than having all these pieces creating a subject. So the idea of cutting apart, I think, and, and dissecting and re, uh, reimagining the, I, it's interesting because I, I think of Apollinaire as being the Whitman of French poetry. Now that's his expansiveness and also what you just said. I mean, he clearly this is collage. And he even, you know, when he says, my best friend, René Dalise, I mean, that's like Picasso pasting in Gertrude Stein's calling card, you know. Uh, and he quotes himself all over the place, Apollinaire. I mean, he's always cutting up things and thinking, I can reuse this here, you know. So it, it, absolutely, it has to do with... And he did conversation poems, like Lundy with Christine is just things he overheard in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, really? So I found out in Duchamp being kind of. Yeah. yeah. What was Duchamp's name? He called himself Sue Sophie. Yes, Sue Sophie. Sue Sophie. Sue Sophie. Yeah. I just wanted to say something. Uh, go back to this thing about biographical detail and the biography of the reader and the biography. You know about it. Um, I'm a musician. I'm not a literary person. One of the hardest things is to is to discern meaning with confidence, to have to trust your instincts when you read, whether it's music or whether it's a vision, a vision or a poem, or whatever it is, to trust your instinct. Mm -hmm. It's so difficult, and we're so reliant on interpretations, mm -hmm. far too reliant on interpretations you have been marvelous about, acknowledging how you change your mind, find your way here. I think that was wonderful. You never thought that way before, and then suddenly you find yourself in it. It's wonderful, but I I feel uh, that when I have had a strong reaction to something, and it may go entirely against what the the canon is of thought about a particular thing, sometimes there's a detail of, a, of the biography of the person who created it that that proves to me the validity of my powerful reaction. I think the thing that comes to mind is that the quality of musical composition. Uh, that, that is recognizable, I swear, when the great composer writes a composition for his child, uh, there is something in that composition which doesn't exist in any other kind of work that the composer writes. And there, that's, that's biography. You don't know that when you first run into these things. There, there's something haunting and absolutely special about it. That's biography. Mm -hmm. it clarifies that you've got Right. <laughs> yes, probably a good thing to end. I, I think so. Well, good thank ending. you very, very much. <laughs>